it's a competition clinching shot. Whoa. How about that? The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Ladies European Tour. Hello, and we're back again with another episode of the LET Golf Podcast, the exclusive podcast of the Ladies European Tour, where we take you behind the scenes to chat to the stars of the show. I'm George Cooper, and with me again from a very sunny South Africa is media official Nicola Kenton. Nicola, what's going on? It's very sunny here in South Africa, but also very windy here in Cape Town. A uh, little bit rainy this week, so we're going to have a mixture of weather for the week ahead. But yes, coming off the back of a great week last week in Joburg, and ready for the next week. That's say poor you as I, as I sit here and it's raining in good old Milton Keynes, but there we go. Nice for some. So yeah, you mentioned it. Joburg Ladies Open last week. Uh, looked like a really good event. We had some fresh faces in contention, an exciting final day. And a first-time winner on the LET. What what went down at Modafontaine? Yes, last week we were talking about the fact that we would hopefully have a first-time winner. And it's happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, Modafontaine, great golf course. Um, some very tough conditions. The rough there is very, very thick. So if you're anywhere but the fairway off the tee, it's extremely challenging and difficult, as we would have seen with some of the highlights that we put out on our social channels. But yeah, it was England's Lily Mae Humphreys. Uh, who came out on top with a final day of 67, so a round of six under, to uh, beat the field by two shots. And as you say, win her first tournament on the LET, she did come through the LET Access Series, having only turned pro in June of 2021. She won the LET Access Series Order of Merit and won on that tour. But yeah, coming onto the LET after her rookie year and now coming out in her first event of the season on the LET and winning. Yeah, what a way to, to win your first event. And she moved straight up to uh, tied second as well in the race to Costa del Sol, uh, which is really encouraging. But yeah, as you mentioned, I think, you know, she had what seemed like a difficult year last year coming on in her rookie year on the LET. Um, so to start this year, you know, we, we know she's got the game, but to start with a win is just it's just fantastic. And uh, yeah, a worthy winner in the end with that with that 67 on the final day. Yeah, exactly. She spoke to me midweek about um, the confidence levels last year because... She had one top 10 result and a couple of top 20s, but that was it in her rookie season on the LET. So um, she just didn't have her confidence where she wanted it and her performance was also lacking. So over the winter, she worked really hard on those two things. She's come out to South Africa to play on the Sunshine Ladies Tour um, to kind of warm up ahead of the rest of the LET season. And boom, it's absolutely worked. Um, as you said, she's got that win under her belt. She's moved up to second in the race to Costa del Sol. And she's also leading the Investec Order of Merit, which is the Order of Merit on the Sunshine Ladies Tour. So it's been a great five weeks for her over here so far. Yeah, really good. And as you mentioned there about the Sunshine Ladies Tour, there were some really good uh, performances from some of the, the home favourites too, wasn't there? Exactly. So Kira Floyd, Joe Berg through and through, um, has been playing at Model Fontaine since she was about seven years old. Absolutely excelled. Uh, especially on the weekend with rounds of 67 and 71 and you know giving the home crowds something to cheer and also uh, Nadia Ben and the best reason <laughs> uh, also in the top 10 as well as LET stalwarts Mikhail Garcia and Leanne Pace so plenty of home interest last week and I'm sure there will be again this week at Steenberg. Yes I'm sure there will be so we obviously move from one South Africa event to another this week and we've got the Investec SA Women's Open. So, Nicola, what should we expect this week on the LET? Well, as you say, it's a back-to-back here in South Africa. We, we've been here several times before. Um, Leanne Pace is coming in as two-time defending champion, looking for her third in a row, but also her sixth overall um, at the SA Women's Open. We have AIG Women's Open champion from last year, Ashley Buhai, in the field this week, straight off the back of her top 10 from the LPGA in Singapore. And there are um, nine of the top 10 from last year's tournament played here at Steenberg are back again in 2023. So expecting lots of big things. And as I said earlier, the wind is definitely going to be a factor this week. It's pretty windy here at this course. So we'll see how the weather conditions change. Yes, should be really interesting then. Uh, and I think one main that one name that you mentioned there, which is sort of the star of the show this week, I guess, is uh, the AIG Women's Open champion, Ashley Buhai. Um, and she just so happens to be our guest for this week, doesn't she, Nicola? Yes, Ash joined us while she was actually over in Asia on the LPGA <laughs> to, to squeeze us in, in her busy schedule. 
Um, but yeah, she hasn't been at this tournament since 2020. That was the last time that she played. She loves to play here and she is a former champion having won in 2018. So yeah, she just spoke us through her career. And obviously you asked her all about her win last year at Muirfield. Yes, I did. So this is Ashley Buhai on the LET podcast. All right, Ash, thanks for joining us on the LET Golf podcast. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks to you. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks for joining us. How are you sort of feeling heading into the 2023? Yeah, obviously excited for the year. Um, you know, 2022 was obviously like my best year on tour and breakthrough year for me. I know it's going to be very difficult to top that, but, um, you know, we've got goals and processes that we're going to try to stick to and hopefully um, we can have just as good a year. Perfect. Yeah, it sounds good. So what we're going to do today on the podcast, we're going to sort of run through your career and your highlights and your best bits. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to take it all the way back to the start, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. Um, so sort of growing up in South Africa, how did you first get into golf? Um, my dad got me into it. Um, I started hitting a golf ball around the age of three years old. Uh, he noticed from a young age that I had pretty good hand-eye coordination and, um, you know, I could catch a, catch a ball, kick a soccer ball. Um, growing up in South Africa, obviously cricket's a big sport, so anything to do with, with a bat and ball, I, I just had interest in put a golf ball and club in my hand and I could hit that too. So, you know, for some reason I was always drawn more to golf and around the age of six, I was dragging him to the driving range. Yeah, it sounds great. So what age did you start and what are sort of your earliest memories playing? Um, I'd say I started playing like properly around six. Um, we couldn't become members of a golf course until you were 10 years old. So that was my, my 10th birthday present was my membership um to our golf course then it was at kensington golf club and we later on a year later merged and became royal johannesburg in kensington um but my earliest memories would be you know my dad taking me to driving range or my mom dropping me off on a saturday afternoon and i would chip and putt till it was dark off while my dad was um you know playing and that's kind of where it all started and then started playing tournaments around the age of 11. yeah it sounds good so what sort of the scene like in south africa growing up playing golf uh, when I was playing, I was one of the one of the only females. Um, you know, during the holidays as a junior, we have the junior foundation, and I would play. We would play three, four tournaments a week, thirty six holes a day, and I was yeah one of the only girls from what I remember. Um, oh wow! So you know, back then it was just me and the guys, and I think it was good for my game to be honest. You know, um, they they played me off the correct tees at least, but I could compete against them. And then once I started playing, you know, ladies amateur tournaments, I think my first one, I was around 12 years old. Um, it was competitive, like, especially when I was playing and the, you know, the amount of tournaments I got to play during the year between school was fantastic. And then kind of from when I was 14, it really started to get serious um, when I was uh, picked for the first time to represent South Africa. Yeah. And you mentioned playing for South Africa there. How much was that an honor um, in your early years, in your teens? Uh, yeah, it was huge. I mean, I remember being like around 13 and I was the best junior at the time, but I didn't get picked. I think they might've thought I was still a bit young and I was devastated. And my dad just said, you know, you just let your clubs do the talking and the rest will take care of itself. And a year later I was chosen for the senior team. Um, so my first time I represented South Africa was at the Commonwealth tournament in New Zealand. And then a year later was, um, the world amateur teams in Puerto Rico. Uh, I think it was, yeah, a year later. And those, so some of my best memories. And obviously um, in 2006, we won it in South Africa, the world amateur teams, which I still say is one of the biggest highlights of my career to date. Sounds amazing. And you went to Puerto Rico. Like, what must that have been like at such a young age? You must have some pretty cool stories, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. I have some cool stories and not a good story. Uh, we stayed in a hotel and it was great. I mean, it was, you know, on the ocean and, um, but, uh, I remember going down to go get an ice cream in the hotel and using US, US dollars and I went to go buy an ice cream and I thought I gave the lady $3 and I said, Oh, I'll just keep the change. It was like $2 50 and I went back to the room and my dad always told me to keep certain money separate and credit cards. So. I went to go check in my travel wallet and I'd realized I'd just given her two one dollar notes and a hundred dollars. And I said, keep the change. Oh. Well, I guess <laughs> I made her day, but um, you know, it's all these learning curves from when you're young and the stories that 
that you get to tell now and things that make you remember that during that time yeah it was all worth it in the end um <laughs> so, <laughs> so you made history in the end you won the the amateur stroke play and the match play double um mm -hmm. talk to me about sort of your memories from doing that yeah my first one i was 14 we played at the strand down in cape town um I still think today it's some of the strongest wins I've ever played in. It was brutal. And uh, yeah, I won the stroke play. And then, you know, anybody who won the stroke play was then the goal to go on to win the, the match play. Um, so I became the youngest to do that, win the South African amateur stroke play match play double. And then the next year, I was the youngest to ever defend it. Um, my goal was to keep going, but one of the years I, I got knocked out. I won the stroke play four years in a row, and then the third year, I got knocked out, I think, in the quarters, but then uh, my final year before turning pro, uh, which was definitely one of my goals before turning pro, was to win the double again. So, you know, in a four-year stretch, to win uh, four stroke plays and, and three match plays, it's, it was pretty cool. Yeah, so I guess the, the road to turning pro was pretty obvious after that, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think it was a crossroads. In this case, turning 18, what do you do? Um, go to college, turn pro. You know, in South Africa during that time, we used to have, um, you know, quite a few professional tournaments between March and April. And a lot of the ladies European tour girls would come down because obviously the weather was good, kind of like we have now, the Sunshine Ladies Tour. And, you know, I managed to win a few events as an amateur. So I knew that I could compete um, and was able to see where my game needed to be. Um, and then, unfortunately, I was never much of a scholar. So <laughs> I wanted to play golf and I knew if I went to college, you know, kind of school could probably keep me back from playing golf so for me it was the best the best route to turn pro and sure I was young but I felt I was ready. So obviously after turning pro you came and played on the LET what was that decision like to make the leap and play across Europe? Yeah it, you know it was going to be tough 18 traveling the world um, I was lucky that I had a, a friend caddy for me and also basically like a supervisor or somebody a chaperone you know, you don't realize these things, you're 18, you can't hire a car, like get from places. Um, but the travel I'd done as an amateur had kind of prepared me for it. I remember, I think my first week I got an invite. I played in, I played, I think in Holland and then Ireland. And then my third invite I got was the Catalonia Ladies Masters. Um, and then that's basically where it all changed. Won, won my third event and that got me my Ladies European Tour card. So. You know, I was obviously very thankful to have those opportunities and it's, you know, bypassed me having to go to Q school. And what are your memories of that tournament in Catalonia? <laughs> what was that feeling like when you were lifting the trophy? Yeah, you know, it was obviously huge. Um, and it was kind of like, oh, well, the life's great. Nothing much has changed. Um, you know, went from a strong amateur career and it kind of felt like, well, this is just going to continue. Uh, another story from that week, we went down into Barcelona and um, my caddy at the time, he's like, oh, I got to have some sangria in Spain, you know, and we, we're sitting down at a restaurant. Anyway, he has some sangria and next minute come to pay and bang, my bag's gone. <laughs> so I was like, oh, no, wallet, everything gone. And I was like, man, but um, ended up obviously working out. Thank goodness that I, I managed to win that week and that made that blow a little bit better. This is becoming a thing, Ash. You you losing wallet, something to do with money. I know, <laughs> and it's not even my fault. I know. Uh, it's uh, anyway. It's life on tour, and uh, these things. It's, it only makes you stronger, and uh, you know, like you say, you have good stories to tell down the road. And as you said, you had such a good amateur career. Obviously, mm -hmm. winning in your third mm -hmm. event was that something that you did expect, or was it kind of an easier transition that maybe you thought it was going to be? Um, I wouldn't say I expected it, but I think when you're young, you're also, you're fearless still, um, you haven't got the scars of professional golf. And I think I came out and I still played free golf, aggressive golf. I think, unfortunately, as the longer you stay on tour, um, you know, we now like to call it smart golf, uh, my coach and I, and you learn a lot more, but, um, you know, there's, as you, as you grow older, there's more responsibilities, financial responsibilities. And I think that can sometimes affect us as professional golfers. And we don't just go out and, and play golf like we used to when we were amateurs. And how much do you think tour life has changed for you? As you say, you're playing kind of different brand of golf now, but in terms mm -hmm. of getting used to the traveling and everything that comes with it, has that changed over obviously the 15 years that you've been out on tour? 
I was, things are a lot easier now. I mean, with, you know, if I think about when we started on the internet and even think about when I was started out playing, David wasn't out on tour. We did long distance three years. I mean, you remember having him having to get phone calling cards to call me overseas. You know, now you just go on WhatsApp or FaceTime and you call. So, you know, internet's made our lives a lot easier. Um, I think also now, often when we're on the road, we're either staying in host housing or Airbnbs, very seldom hotels, because I just like to have some space, be able to cook, be in a comfort. Um, whereas when I was back in Europe, I mean, we were hotel to hotel. And always, I was, we always say we had a great time, the time I did play full time on the ALET. Um, we were like a whole traveling family. You know, you get to a tournament, we'll get on a bus, we go to the next, get to the hotel. Um, the camaraderie between the players was fantastic. And, um, you know, some weeks were harder than others, but, um, you know, I wouldn't change the route that I took for anything in the world. And talk me through, obviously, making that leap onto the LPJ after mm -hmm. being on the LET for a few years. Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of bounced back and forth my first few years. I was having one, it gave me that security of knowing I had a tour card for two years on the LET, and I, I went straight away to LPJ Coup School. And I feel that was my first real heartbreak. I was, back then, there was only... 16 cards available that year at, L at LPJ. I was in it the whole way through five rounds, finished bogey, bogey, missed my, my card by one. So that was hard for me. It was like my first, I want to say, real failure I'd felt. And then kind of try to play both tours, but it was difficult. Um, not only knowing two weeks before you enter an LPJ event, you fly from South Africa to get there. So between there and 20, end of 2009, I bounced back and forth, but after losing my card in LPG, I just, you know, kind of reset, changed coaches, went back to the LET in 2010 um, and played full time uh, until the end of 20, 2013. And I think it just, you know, got my confidence back, um, rehoned my game. You know, so many different elements that we have to play in in Europe. Um, and then went back to Q school in 2013 and been in LPG full time since. In terms of um, coming back and playing on the LET, obviously, I know you like to play the co-sanctioned events across the summer and come back when mm -hmm. you can. How mm -hmm. important is it for you that you do that and you still get to come and see us? I think it's very important. Again, you know, I was taught never forget where you come from and where you started. So I think it's very important for, you know, players who have gone on to other tours that they go back and support where they started because uh, it only you know, grows the tour. Um, unfortunately now due to the schedule, just can't play as much as I used to. I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> um, I remember one year I did 11 in a row bouncing back and forth, um, which was, I think back now and think, man, that was crazy. But, you know, again, life experiences that I, I wouldn't swap for anything. Absolutely. And you mentioned just there sort of about Q school using setbacks to sort of bounce back almost like you know using its fuel as fire as such mm -hmm. um now we've got to talk about the ARG women's open and your historic win in tw last year um but sort of taking it back to sort of your heartache in 2019 to begin with how much did you sort of what did you learn from that and, and sort of how mm -hmm. much did you use that as fuel to be like okay I really want to win this now I think 2019 taught me that I knew I could compete with the best and I had a chance to win um you know, playing in the final group the last two days, you know, I was behind going in the last day, but I remember like, especially coming down the stretch and some of the golf shots that I hit under pressure, um, it taught me a lot about myself and being able to pull things off when you needed to. And I've always been a player that's played better when my back's against the wall for some reason. Um, you know, a lot of my wins is even as an amateur came from behind. Um, and I think I just play free of golf when you know, well, you have to just give it your all. And obviously going into last year's ARG Women's Open, five shot lead, it was very different. But, you know, I played good golf the whole day and one bad swing, you know, nearly cost everything. But I just said, well, you've done too, too much hard work to get to this point. You know, let's just keep grinding it and give yourself the best shot you can. Yeah, and you seemed, well, it seemed watching on, you seemed relatively calm in that mm. playoff. But so sort of how <laughs> nerve wracking actually was it? Yeah, of course, inside, you know, your stomach's turning and, you know, you're trying to breathe. But the whole week I felt relatively calm. And I do say this, that like when you're playing well and things are going your way, um, I feel it's 
often a lot easier than when I find it should have just say this way. I find it more pressure when I'm trying to make a cut or I'm on the cut line. Because often you don't have your A your A game, you have your B or your C game. Whereas when you're trying to win a tournament, you got your A game and things are most likely falling into place and you don't have to think of as many things. So, you know, that whole week I said I had my processes, I had my thoughts, and I just try to stick to that one thought. And that's what got me through so much. And that's all I try to do. Like I try to think of rhythm and tempo and hopefully the rest would take care of itself. Yeah, and you touched on it there. It's almost your mental strength as much mm. as your um you know your your golfing strength there now i actually chatted to your mental coach in the past duncan mm -hmm. yeah. um who was obviously full of praise and i know that you know you owed a lot to him for that victory and you've spoken very candidly about it in the mm -hmm. past but how crucial has it been working with him and how much has just sort of your mental approach to the game changed in the last few years yeah i mean i only started with him at the beginning of last year and we actually had a conversation not you know before the season started and he said well have you actually gone back and looked at like the messages and to see where you were at the start of last year like i said if you had told me that i was going to win a golf tournament let alone a major like the beginning of last year obviously i would have said you were crazy um but it's amazing what happens when the mental side just comes together because my coach we'd been discussing i've been swinging it so well for so long and just there was just something missing and my coach doug would put me in contact with duncan and again it was just going back to be more process based and focusing on the now and step by step instead of just the outcome and i think as golfers we are judged on the outcome so much because that's how we make a living but we forget about the steps we need to take to get there so you know, every week we had little goals and those little goals then just started to build and build. And by April, things started to turn around. And, um, you know, I played good at, I feel from KPMG on, my game was really starting to trend in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously amazing scenes on the 18th at the end when you won that. Uh, your husband, David, <laughs> more nervous than you, I think. Oh, yeah. Like, is that something that you, you, you constantly bring up with him and remind him of that moment and, and watched it back together? Uh, um, I think it, people around us remind him more than I remind him. And again, <laughs> I think it's just when you're in the moment, everything's such a blur. And, um, you know, when you watch, watch it back, and I've seen a footage from one of our friends were filming from behind that I think is the funniest of him running on the green. And he throws his cap and you see his cap go off and then obviously he runs in and picks me up um yeah obviously it, was, it was a very special moment for us because you know he decided in 2010 to sacrifice everything to come caddy for me um, and give up what he was doing so that i could still carry on fulfilling my goals so you know i say obviously it was a huge one for me and my caddy at tanya at the time but like for what he's given up and for basically all the highs and lows and the tears along the way you know he's behind the scenes and has to deal with it all um you know just just as much as a victory for him i think in a way yeah absolutely and is it sort of sunk in yet that you are a major champion <laughs> yeah every now and then it has its moments and i still think man like you know i actually did it and i think you know i started watching that the new netflix series full swing and i watched the first episode last night and the first one Justin Thomas and he says oh man I wish it would actually you know kind of s slow down because it all goes so quickly when you're in it everything happens so quickly you you win you get taken off and you don't have time to actually enjoy it at that at that moment it only really hits you maybe a few weeks later or even a few months and every now and then I still think now when something pops up on social media and that's when I, I realized what I was actually able to achieve yeah, for sure. And what about sort of the support back home? Um, how was that? Mm. How was that going back to South Africa after after the historic oh, yeah. win? Yeah, it was cool. I mean, unfortunately, I only went back December, so it was like a bit of a lull in between. But um, my my home club, Royal Johannesburg and Kensington, put on an evening for me um, to celebrate with family, friends, members. I think about one hundred and twenty people there. Um, Dan Nickel, who's a, a very well known personality and presenter back home, he, we did a a Q&A together um, so everybody could kind of relive it and they had the highlights playing on a big screen so you know it was very special finally being able to go home and share with the people that have known me since I was a kid been with me through the highs and lows and um, 
you know, finally be able to like share this moment with all of them. And how much um, do you think golf has grown in South Africa in the 15 years since you turned pro? How much has it changed? Yeah, I think it's, you know, grown immensely. I mean, you can see now we have the Sunshine Ladies Tour, um, you know, that gives the girls an opportunity to play and test themselves. Um, and I still think that's why I was able to take the leap so early because I was able to play against professionals. So I think it's very important. Um, amateur golf too. And I think it shows, you know, there's only unfortunately two of us on the LPGA at the moment, but there's a bunch of girls in Europe and um, a few more coming through in the amateur ranks and some in college. So I think it's definitely in, in a, a stronger position. It's been, you know, maybe the last six years, it's the best that it's it's been in a while since maybe I say I was a player as an amateur. And obviously you're coming back to the LET this year to play in the Abest Act. South African Women's mm -hmm. Open for the first mm -hmm. time in three years, is it, since you've been back across? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. important is it that you kind of play in that tournament and have that connection to the people at home? For me, it's it's hugely important. Um, you know, it's something that I've tried to do every year before COVID I played, no matter what my schedule was. Uh, I'm very patriotic. I feel it's very important to support your home events. Um, and, you know, if that's your way of trying to give back and create exposure for an event. So, you know, during COVID with the, all the dates getting turned around and not quite falling in the right place in this in the schedule, I wasn't able to and I was really disappointed. So I am excited to be able to go back, you know, play again in front of hopefully our home fans, Cape Town. They're, they're known to come out and support. Um, so, yeah, I just, I'm just looking really forward to being able to be in my home comforts again. And you mentioned David before, obviously, as you said, he came out mm -hmm. and caddied for you obviously caddying for other players now, but what is it like to have mm -hmm. him on tour, even though obviously he's on a different bag quite a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but still mm -hmm. have him there with you? Yeah, it's huge. You know, it's like, he's my sounding board. He's, you know, it makes life on tour a lot easier because if I'm doing a four or five week stretch, um, you know, that would be very difficult when you're doing long distance relationships. We've all done it as professional athletes. So, you know, it's still having someone to come home to and also like if anything's up with my game and he's able to, he'll have a quick look and, you know, give me advice. Like, yeah, nobody really knows my game better than him other than my coach. So to have him here as a sounding board and support is, is huge for me. And is there any time when you're not talking about golf when, when you do talk <laughs> about other things instead? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess whatever that happened during the day, obviously, our lives do revolve around golf. There's no getting away from it. And and I am a golf nerd, um, you know, it's to the point where, like, we're playing a tournament and I played in the morning and the golf's on in the afternoon, I'll watch the golf. And people are like, really? But I just love it. It's in my blood and I'm so passionate. So, you know, obviously, I don't know, there's, there's days when we're not talking about golf, but, you know, it's just part of our lives. And he's a golf addict himself too, so. And um, how important was it for golf to get in the Olympics for you? Was that a big milestone as um, obviously it gives more, bigger platform to the world for the golf, for golfing mm -hmm. world to, you know, reach different countries. But as you say, as a golfing nerd, mm -hmm. to be able to suddenly go to the Olympics, was that something where you were like, oh, what is this? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, it was really cool. Uh, it's not something you're growing up is going, oh, I want to go to the Olympics because it was never an option. When you grow up, you, you want to win a major. Um, but then once being given that opportunity, it was one of the coolest experiences of my life going to Rio, um, you know, to rub shoulders with all these amazing athletes and see how they go about doing their work and their job. And for me, that's what it was about, staying in the village and, and you know, taking it all in. Um, no, I chose not to go to Tokyo just because of, you know, everything that was happening in the world, COVID, I just felt uncomfortable, but I am hoping that I, I will be able to be there in, in France. And in terms of outside of the golf course, um, when you are not watching golf, either of you, <laughs> what are you doing? I know that you used to be able to play the guitar and do have a, another few talents. Is, is that what you're yeah. still doing now? No, I mean, the kind of the guitar thing started and ended quickly once you get on tour. Like, I'm I'm a huge music lover. Um, so I'm often, you know, in my off time, I am either just 
love just lying on my couch at home watching series or any sort of sports um listening to the latest music going through what i can find um you know just being home i'm I'm very much a homebody when i do have time off and being around friends you know dave and i we've now been living in palm beach gardens for three years and we've um got a nice group of friends there so we enjoy going to restaurants and having dave's a great we call him a briar or it's a barbecue <laughs> if you want to say um so yeah we just really like to just you know get away from golf that way and be with friends and family when we're back in south africa soon brilliant right ash to finish we have a new segment on our podcast where we like mm -hmm. to do a quiz with okay. our special guest <laughs> so we've got a series of questions for you now i'm mm -hmm. going to see how you get on okay. um, sound good sounds good okay perfect all right mm -hmm. so question number one and we touched on it earlier you mm -hmm. won the catalonia masters in 2007 in just mm -hmm. your third ever event mm -hmm. what was your winning score uh, no idea. <laughs> Have a guess? No? Maybe like between 9 and 12 under? I was 8 under. You okay. oversold yourself. It was a tough one to start. It's not time easy, ago. this quiz. You'll, you'll yeah. learn. If, you, if you're a regular <laughs> listener, we, we, we don't make it easy. Right. Question number two. You obviously represented your country in the 2016 Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. Now that year, there were two South Africans to win gold medals. Can mm -hmm. you name who they are? Uh, Wade van Niekerk. Yes. And um, is it gold medals? Yes. Gold medal. I'm trying to think. Sorry. Didn't he win two? He's no. just he's one winner. He just won one that year mm -hmm. in the 400 meters. Yeah. And we've got another. We've got Cast another Correct, yeah. Okay. Very good. Right. The year's 2018 and you won the Investec South African Women's Open on home mm -hmm. soil. Who was runner-up? No idea. <laughs> she, she's German. Uh, uh, Carolina Lambert. Correct, yes. Right, this is a tough one. But I think you can. I think you can do it. Well, this has been now, tough. <laughs> can you name all the South Africans to have ever won on the LET? I'd say Liam Pace. Uh, Correct. Myself. Um, trying to think. Well, Nicole Garcia's won the Ramco Series events. Stacy won Ramco with the series event with me, the team event. I don't know who played. I don't know if Lorette, Lorette Moritz ever won. Yeah, Correct, she yes. did. Yeah, she L won. Lally. Yeah. And then that's a lot before my time. I'm <laughs> going back before Yeah, that. There's, there's three more if that helps. Three more. Don't know. No. So no. we got Karen Lowe. Okay. Uh, yeah. Alison Shared. Yes. And Ray Hass. Okay. Alison won the British. Yeah. Before it was an yeah. idea, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Your name's on the trophy. Pretty good effort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and final question. What is your lowest ever score on the LET? And can you name which tournament it was at? My lowest is 63. Correct. Was it maybe uh, Buckinghamshire? Those European Masters? That's the one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember which year? I think it probably would have been... I think because I know I finished third, I think, and that got me a week then into the next week at St. Andrews. I remember having to finish top three. And Webby won that year, I think. Or was it L Lydia? I can't remember. Maybe. Yeah, I, I can't remember the year. Yeah, it was 2013, okay. but that's a good effort. You yeah. were <laughs> two out of three right on that question. So pretty good, I'd say. Yeah. You definitely did better, than, you did better than I thought, actually. There's some <laughs> tough ones in there. So amazing. Right, that's cool. all we've got time for then, Ash. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the LET podcast. You've been you've been a great guest. Um, thank you. And obviously, enjoy enjoy being back home and and best of luck this week in South Africa. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Right, so there we go. One awesome chat with Ashley Buhai there about her golfing journey, life on the LET, and of course that historic win at the AIG Women's Open last year. And I mean, who could forget that ridiculous bunker shot in the, bar in the dark at Muirfield as she won in the playoff against Nzi Chan? I mean, it was just ridiculous, wasn't it? 
So yeah, as mentioned, Ash will be teeing up at the Investec SA Women's Open this week. We'll be bringing you all the action from Steamboat Golf Club. So keep an eye on our social platforms at LET Golf for all the exclusive content and interviews coming from the tournament. Until then, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the LET Golf Podcast. If you did, please leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or whichever platform you're streaming from. And we'll see you again next week where we'll have another special guest joining the pod. Thanks for joining in, guys, and enjoy the golf. It's a competition clinching shot. Whoa. How about that? The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of...